Today is kind of part two of our meeting from last time. Last time we started talking about Jesus and how he fits into this violence in the Bible thing. And we talked about passages where Jesus seems to contradict a lot of the what's going on in the Old Testament, at least in terms, you know, at least on the face of it, um, that, you know, he says, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. When he's on the cross, he um, reminds Peter and, and his other disciples that they shouldn't retaliate even when he's being arrested in the garden. Um, and then we've got the Sermon on the Mount that we looked at closely last time for some deeper understanding of how Jesus kind of ups the ante seemingly on some of the, the standard um, laws that we find in, in the Old Testament. Um, but we kind of talked about how there are two, two things going on there that can, that can complicate things. First, that strict pacifism only goes so far in, in practical terms when you get to a situation where, you know, your, your life or your body or your possessions are at risk or, you know, for some people, they don't really care about themselves so much, but when they see someone else being harmed, is it really our call to do nothing or to, you know, leave it up to God to get that, that justice? Um, or are we supposed to be God's hands and voice in the world and speak up and speak out and get involved, even if it means, you know, stepping into a violent situation, potentially doing violence ourselves. And then we also talked about the, um, the Old Testament witness and, and does, you know, does the witness of Jesus supersede the Old Testament? Um, but we, we kind of came to the conclusion that no, because if we look at the Old Testament from the perspective that we've been using, using the glasses that we have been using, then that message about how um, God chooses individuals, God sent um, God's own son to not to judge, but to bring a blessing to the nations, to bring reconciliation to all the world. And so this is um, actually just a continuation of what has been going on the whole time. So today um, we're going to talk about kind of the other side of the coin um, just for a few minutes. There isn't quite as much of, of um, Jesus as a vengeful God as there is Jesus as a pacifist, but there are, there are some things in there I think that are, um, that are important for us to lift up and, and think about a little bit in terms of violence and when violence is appropriate, um, if violence is ever appropriate. So um, we did talk already about Matthew chapter 5, um, verses 17 to 20, so I won't uh, make you turn to that today, but that's just the one where Jesus said that he came not to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. And so Jesus is reminding us that he is providing an interpretive lens for how to read the Old Testament. He is not repudiating it as a whole, um, but that Jesus is making sure that we are reading it correctly because we, of course, as violent and selfish humans want to read um, with those violent and selfish tendencies to get what we want to get out of our reading. And so Jesus is providing us um, with a different kind of lens. But some of the things that Jesus said and did seem to indicate that there can be, you know, there can be violence sometimes that is, um, is proper and, and even holy. So let's start today um, by looking at John chapter 2, verses 13 to 17. So these are all um, short, short readings today. So John chapter 2. 13 to 17? Yes. Are you going to read it, Pam, or do you want me to? Go ahead. Okay. I'll read the next one. 13 to 17. Okay. The Passover of the Jews was near, 
and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple, he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and the money changers seated at their tables. Making a whip of cords, he drove all of them out of the temple, both the sheep and the cattle. He also poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. He told those who were selling the doves, take these things out of here. Stop making my father's house a marketplace. I love it. This one says shopping mall. It's just more, more current. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I like that. So that's quite the scene. We kind of try to picture that in our minds. Uh, the temple was divided into courts, into sections. At the very center of the temple, of course, was the Holy of Holies, where they kept the Ark of the Covenant and the, um, you know, the, only the high priest could go in once a year. And it was so dangerous that they would have to tie a rope around him and tie bells to his ankles so that they could stand outside of the, the curtain and listen. And if the, the bells stopped jingling when, to indicate that he had stopped walking, then they would have to drag him out because it was understood that he had died in the presence of God, that he was not worthy and that God had smote him. And so there's, there's that. And then there um, is the area where the priests can go, the area where Jewish men can go, the area where Jewish men and women can go, and then the area where Gentiles can go. And when you went to the temple, um, at this time, of course, you were often traveling from a long distance. There was a lot more um, uh, adherence to the, to the Jewish faith who lived outside of the immediate area of, of Judea. Um, we, you know, we had people, many, many Jews living in Egypt. Um, of course, Babylon from, from after the uh, exile were still there, Assyria, all over the place. And so if you were to travel to the temple to do your sacrifices, which you were supposed to do um, at least once a year to participate in the High Holy Days, you didn't want to have to bring all the stuff you needed along with you. That would be crazy to have to bring all those different birds and sheep and goats and cows and, you know, whatever else you needed um, to bring with you. And so it was more convenient to just buy it when you got there. But as we've discussed in the past, that was not what the law said, right? You were supposed to, to choose an animal from your own flock because the point isn't the animal, the point is what the animal represents. And so this, um, you know, th this change in the way that this was practiced for the, for, you know, for legitimate practical reasons, um, was kind of taking things away from the, the intended purpose. The other thing that was going on was the, um, the Jewish authorities um, kind of determined that the money of the empire, the money that you would typically use day to day to buy and sell your goods um, was profane because it had the face of Caesar on it, the emperor. And that was not, you know, that was not to enter into the temple. And so you had to use special temple money in order to buy and sell within the market of the temple. So if you wanted to buy your dove or buy your sheep or whatever it was you needed for the particular sacrifice you wanted to do, you had to go to a money changer in the same way that we, you know, as soon as you land in Germany or wherever it is you're going, you go to um, exchange your dollars for euros or your dollars for yen or whatever it is you're looking for. And um, this, it was the same thing. When you went to the temple, you had the first place you went was you had to go and exchange your money so that when you went into the temple, you could purchase the things that you needed um, to make the sacrifices that you needed. So again, a very practical thing. I think it's legitimate to say that the, you, know, you don't want money that has the face of the emperor on it in your holy space. You don't want that reminder that the emperor owns this money, the emperor kind of owns the economy, owns you you want it to be about God. But now, you know, now we're not just changing the money, but we are charging for 
the privilege of changing the money or charging some kind of interest on, on the amount of money that you exchange. And so again, you know, we're, we're kind of getting further away from the original intention of all of this. So Jesus sees all this going on and you can only imagine, you know, if it's, if it's a high holy day when there are hundreds and, um, and thousands of people milling around um, that aren't, aren't from Jerusalem, they don't live there, but they're there for this special, um, special celebration, special festival. And they're, of course, they've got to have extra cows and extra sheep and extra goats and extra doves all over the place so that they can sell enough for all the people that need them to have their sacrifices. And then we've got, you know, multiple priests working round the clock nonstop to try to get all these sacrifices finished up for all the people who are waiting in line to do their sacrifice. It must have just been absolute chaos in this marketplace. And Jesus goes in and he, um, he just can't take it. He gets very angry. And this is one of the only places in, um, in the gospel record where we really see anger, where we see passion um, in Jesus. And he, I, I, I like this version from John because it talks about how he made a whip of cords. He didn't just yell at them, but he, he got violent, physically violent. And he drove everything out and yelled at them about how they should not turn the temple into a shopping mall. I like that one. So what do we think of this? If Jesus is, you know, Jesus is allowed to do whatever he wants, obviously he's Jesus. But if we're supposed to follow his example, what are we supposed to learn from this, from the perspective of violence and whether violence is appropriate or not? Well, I think one thing we learn is that he's human, that, uh, it, he he uh, understands, you know, about anger, <laughs> and uh, I've always found that to be um, comforting to know that Jesus experienced everything that we do. You know that uh, that he really he he was in human form, so. Um, but I also think that it uh, points out um, how easy people get lured into hypocrisy of saying one thing and then doing another and um, saying that they're going to uphold this um, rule and then in some other way they create violence against other people, you know, either by ignoring them or denying them or whatever but they don't live what they say they believe mm -hmm. well it seems that also i mean i don't know that jesus would have done this if everything it seems like everything was terribly excessive mm. you know it's i you you i i don't know if it's possible to change money without some kind of a charge but this says the loan sharks were also there in full strength so that includes, you know, it, you know let's see, in, interest was illegal back then. Spit. So maybe if you just charge enough, keep a living, that would be okay. But excessive interest, I think, was really frowned upon. I just got the impression that the, the sales were just over the top. Mm. And that was why, you know. I don't understand how they kept things going because we really need those pieces of money with our leaders on them. To keep our churches. Going. <laughs> that really, that really changed over the course of the thousand or two years. Yes. So. <laughs> yes. That attempt to stay separated in that way. Yeah. Kind of fell off. So what's the next one? Um, so let's so the next one, the Jews were upset. What's that? I was just thinking, you know, like, like, how did the people respond to this? And I, I've forgotten, so I'll read ahead. Okay. So the, the, uh, the, the leaders, the Jewish leaders get upset, and, but they're afraid of the crowds, and so they don't do anything at this point. But um, for the Gospel of John, 
the, this is only chapter two and already, you know, the, the, the ending is kind of already established that they're, they're already kind of plotting to get rid of this guy. And so it's not a, uh, not a book long, uh, not, it's not a very quick thing, but it takes the whole, the whole of the narrative to get him, get rid of this guy. <laughs> Um, all right, let's go next to um, Revelation chapter 19. All right, Pam. Uh huh. I think I'm allergic it, to something. <laughs> so am I. I have been suffering for a week and I don't know what it is in my house that's causing me. Hmm. Is, is your heat starting to kick on because it got cold? Maybe it's just all the dust coming out of the heat. I think that's part of it, but I'm wondering, yeah, if, it's, I wonder if it's the dog. So if he's just right here. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't right. know. I would... Oh, this will be good. Uh, I'm interested to hear what your version says here, Pam. So we're gonna look at um, Revelation chapter 19, verses 11 through 15. Let's see, 11. Okay, okay, stop me if I go too far because my, 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 mine is in a section 11 through 16. So. Oh, that's close enough. <laughs> okay. Then I saw heaven open wide, and oh, a white horse and its rider, the rider named Faithful and True, judges and makes war in pure righteousness, his eyes are a blaze of fire, on his head many crowns. He has a name inscribed that's known only to himself. He is dressed in a robe soaked with blood, and he is addressing as word of and he is addressed as word of God. The armies of heaven, mounted on white horses and dressed in dazzling white linen, follow him. A sharp sword comes out of his mouth, so he can subdue the nations, then rule them with a rod of iron. He treads the winepress of the raging wrath of God, the sovereign strong. On his robe and thigh is written, King of Kings, Lord of Lords. All right. So what kind of image of Jesus do we get here? Is this the baby in the manger or the passive man dying on the cross? Nobody. <laughs> well, like the guy at the temple, then some. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So interesting yeah. that there are many places in your translation, Pam, where there are many liberties taken to try to modernize the imagery. But here, I think perhaps because it's so foreign and it's intended to be foreign, it was left left more or less as is. Right. I noticed that too. Was it last time we met that there was that 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 passage about the guy dressed in white linen soaked in blood is that like this um did we have something like that last time i don't remember that it was a long been, time ago must have been us because i remember asking john how could you have a white robe that's soaked in blood i don't know so okay i just assumed it was the hem of it yeah, so whose blood do you, we think that is? I don't know. Hmm. Uh, that's, a, that's an interesting question. Yeah. Well, let me see. He judges and makes war in pure righteousness. Huh. So maybe it's the armies that he's fighting. I don't know. So who's he fighting? Okay. A heaven open wide and a white horse in its rider. Oh, I don't know. This is strange. Of course, I think all all of Revelation is strange anyway. It is. But. It is. So it's a it's an interesting question. Um, the people that he's fighting, or not even really fighting, I don't think it's fair to call it war when it's, you know, 
Jesus against the nations, but in verse 15, it says, so it says that, makes war. Yeah, it does say, it does say makes war. And yeah. then in verse 15, it says um, the, the sharp sword he's using with which to strike down the nations. And so is the blood from the nations? Is the blood from, you know, the nations that he's already subdued? Um, but it says the sword comes out of his mouth. So is that just a verbal lashing? Could be. Or, you know, because of who we know this is talking about, could the blood be his own? Mm. Mm -hmm. You know, the blood that he has already shed. And so we get all of these violent images, but even within those violent images, there's the possibility of kind of reinterpreting, reshaping what that means. So yeah, from his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. And so... And then rule them with a rod of iron. Where does love come into that? Hmm. And he will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God, the Almighty. I think, um, I think some of it, you know, you can kind of read these things like a sharp sword from his mouth. So we're talking about speaking justice, um, speaking righteousness. I think we could, I, I, I would say that the blood is his own. I think that the, that's kind of a, a reference to the fact that your typical warrior is covered in the blood of his enemies because he's good at killing. But this warrior is clothed in a robe covered in his own blood because who- He comes that way, right? Yeah, who died? Yeah, he, who, he comes that way. And yeah. it's because who died? Not the nations, not the world, yeah. but himself. Yeah. So I think there's that, but I think the other thing to remember here too is back to our conversations that we had in Daniel. Who is, you know, who is Revelation written for? Again, it's the it's for those people who are oppressed, those people who have nothing, no hope, nothing to cling to. And so they need something that's going to, you know, help them to move forward. Um, Katie, do you think this is where we got the white horses and the white knight and the oh yeah, white being good? Yeah, some of it. And I mean, white, it's always been that way, you know, and, and even in a lot of the Old Testament stuff, light and darkness imagery, uh, you know, night and day, white and black, a lot of that, that kind of stuff is in, in uh, the Old Testament. The only one I can think of who's black was a two would be Zorro and Batman. Nobody <laughs> else who's good is, is black, so I think. Well, and, and uh, Batman is not always as good as he is made out of. <laughs> don't, don't dissuade me. <laughs> the, dark, the dark night. <laughs> um, so, so I think point, point, two points here that we want to take with us as we're, you know, figuring out how to read this stuff. Questioning, in what capacity is Jesus acting as a warrior here? You know, clearly this is supposed to be Christ, the, you know, the, the risen Christ, Lord of all creation, um, coming to um, get, get true justice for, um, for his people. But he is acting as a warrior, not as a human, enacting his own vengeance, but as god as as a as a messenger from of god to bring god's justice so again you know that important reminder that we are not to enact our own sense of justice um and on whose behalf is he acting as a warrior he's working on behalf of the powerless against whom the the um against all the people who um, do violence to those powerless people, just as we saw in the Old Testament. So again, there's there's no difference um, here versus the, all the stuff that we were looking at earlier in terms of how God is acting in a violent way on behalf of um, those who experience violence at the hand of human human people, um, but not um, 
as Sam pointed out, not to destroy them because he isn't striking them down with a, an actual sword. He's striking them down with a sword from his mouth. And so in what way is he striking them down? Well, maybe he's correcting them. Maybe he's, um, maybe he's, you know, doing that, that, that action of reconciling and restoring things to what they should be in the same way that we've talked about before. What did I do? <laughs> oh, we lost your picture. I know, I don't know what I did. Karen, put your finger on alt and hit tab a couple, hit tab. I can't, I don't have an alt and a tab. You don't? Then I can't help you. <laughs> Um, okay, so uh, so how do we how do we how do we do this in our world? Okay, so a couple things came to mind. Um, so so he's talking to people and having them straighten their ways. So we were having a discussion the other night, and I was thinking if someone thinks if, if a person of another political persuasion comes and tries to talk me out of my beliefs. I'm not going there. And apparently they wouldn't either. So I, mm. I don't know how you talk to someone out of something really. Well, so that's actually a perfect transition. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> um, because that, that was kind of all I had for, you know, just to kind of mention some of this, some of these elements that of Jesus, but it's, it's all point being that it's all repetition. It's, it's all the same message that we've already talked over and over and over and over through um, the Old Testament. Um, so, so I think um, kind of this, today is the last day that we're really going to talk about this kind of overarching theme through the Bible. We've got um, next week we're going to talk about um, a specific topic, atonement theories, uh, because that is violent. You know, why did Christ have to die? And then um, the final week we're going to talk about the final judgment and, and what that has to do with um, violence, kind of a permanent eternal violence that God might be doing. So I wanted to spend the rest of our time today just kind of summarizing and, and um, pulling, pulling back and kind of looking at this whole thing um, as a whole. And I think how we read the Bible is really the, the crux of the matter here because I've, I've introduced you to quite a few challenging um, ways to read the Bible, suggestions about how we are reading the Bible incorrectly if all we're doing is just reading the story on um, you know as as it is on the face of it and trying to follow along with what's happening um that i've given you you know different tools to try out in an attempt to find something that is meaningful um and the the technical term for how we read the bible is hermeneutics how we read the bible and another um Another more controversial term um, that comes out of um, theology and, and other study areas, but theology in this particular case, is the term meta narrative, which you may or may not have heard before. And the meta narrative is what is the big overarching theme? What does what is the what is the big picture? What is if you could if you had to summarize this whole thing in one sentence? What is this about? And there are some, many um, scholars who don't believe in meta narrative. They don't think that that's fair. Um, there are so many different voices in the Bible. There are so many different purposes for why they wrote and when they wrote and how they wrote and to whom they wrote that it's not fair to try to stuff them all into one message. Sure. Um, we also have people who are, you know, kind of more postmodern um, thinkers who don't, you know, who think everything's relative. And so for each person, there's going to be a different meaning. And so there is no one capital T truth for every person in every time and every place. And so to impose a meta narrative on the Bible is to suggest that your personal, um, you know, individualized meta narrative applies to everyone. And that's arrogant and incorrect. And you shouldn't do that. Um, and, I, you know, I, being a younger person, um, but not so young that I am, you know, part of the post-postmodern world. 
Um, I do have postmodern tendencies, but I, I do believe in meta narrative, especially when we're talking about the Bible. I believe that there is a bigger st purpose, a bigger story, and that yes, even within those individual purposes, individual goals, individual you know writings, individual audiences, that all of it can be read with a particular set of glasses through a particular lens. And so you just have to figure out what is that lens, what is that theme through which we should read all of the Bible, even and including passages that seem to contradict it from the perspective of what we think is the most important thing. And so, you know, everybody kind of does this automatically, but to me, I think what's important is to be aware that you're doing it and to be aware of what your meta narrative is. Um, because if you aren't, then you're going to read and you're going to have a meta narrative, but you're not even going to know what it is. And so you're going to probably confuse yourself or, you know, even worse, kind of guide yourself down a really dangerous and terrible path in terms of the way that you start interpreting stories and the way that you start building up your understanding of who God is and who you are. So I'm not suggesting that, you know, you, st you find your thing and you, you know, if you, if you open up the Bible one day and you're brand new to the faith and you read one verse and you say, oh, well, this is what the Bible must be about. And so from now until eternity, I must read it, you know, through this lens and no matter what, even if I come up against a contradiction, that's not what I'm suggesting. But I think that after reading a lot, you kind of start to get a feel for what is this message about? What is it that God is trying to say to us as humans? And I think it's important to, you know, to be aware of that. Um, but I think too that, you know, when we are trying to figure this out, everybody's going to have a different opinion. What passages do you point to often? What passages do you avoid pointing to because they're more troubling? Um, when, you know, when you are asked to describe who God is to you, how do you do that? And how is it that the way that I describe God and, and what's important in this world is so different than somebody else who is reading the exact same Bible as me? And I think it's, it's because we all have those different perspectives. We all have different backgrounds. And so I can tell you, you know, if you want what I think the Bible is about and what, what the meta narrative is from my perspective. But I think what would be more convincing and more helpful is for us to think about what was Jesus's her hermeneutical lens? How did Jesus read the Bible? And we have some evidence for that um, in, in the Gospels, and particularly um, the Gospel of Matthew. Matthew was incredibly interested in um, proving that Jesus is the fulfillment of Scripture. Matthew has the most references to the Old Testament um, out of any of the New Testament writings. And so what I did was I went through uh, um, Matthew and I pulled out um, not every single reference to the Old Testament. Um, there are many, many more than the ones that I pulled out, but I pulled out the ones that are in the mouth of Jesus himself. So when Jesus talks, when Jesus quotes scripture, what is he quoting? And that is, if you got my email earlier, that is what... Um, I sent out to everyone. So if you can look at your version or I will pull up um, my version and share my screen with you. Okay. That is not what you want to see. Haha, <laughs> there it is. All right. So let's make this big. So what I what I did was I just went through and I found places where Jesus quoted a passage from the Old Testament, and then I um, put over on on the other columns where where that came from, and then the text of that verse or set of verses. 
and we don't have to read every single one of these because there are quite a few of them. Um, and Jesus did quote scripture in the other gospels too, but like I said, Matthew is the one that has the most um, passages that quote scripture because Matthew was particularly dedicated to proving that Jesus is the fulfillment of the Hebrew scripture. And so he goes to great lengths to make sure that he is constantly quoting. And in fact, he was um, quite the literalist himself. My favorite um, quote of the Old Testament in the New Testament appears in um, the Gospel of Matthew in the um, triumphal entry, the, the Palm Sunday reading in Matthew, because um, in all the other Gospels, Jesus sends his disciples and they go and um, find a donkey and they say to the owner of the donkey, the Lord needs this. And so they send the donkey along. But in the Gospel of Matthew, they go and they find two donkeys. One is the mother donkey and the other is its colt. And the reason for this is because Matthew quotes from the Psalms, um, he came riding on a donkey and on the colt, a foal of the donkey. And so he, I think the writer of Matthew doesn't, um, doesn't have any sense of poetic license or parallelism in poetry because a lot of times you get that that repetition right you get you know the you they say the same thing twice just with different words well in his opinion that meant that the that Jesus was riding two donkeys at the same time and so my uh one of my one of my professors used to say and that is the only physical description we have of Jesus. He was morbidly obese. He was so fat that he had to have two donkeys to ride into Jerusalem on, which of course, you know, not true, but a little, a little theology joke there from him. So anyway, I didn't quote any of that stuff. I just put what came out of the, out of the mouth of Jesus within the gospels. And I, I think it would be helpful for us to kind of just go through these. Like I said, we're not going to read all of them, but to just kind of get a sense of what is it that Jesus emphasized? What, what was Jesus's meta narrative? So you see um, the first few verses are from the, um, the temptation in the desert when Satan, Hasatan, the, the tempter came, the accuser came to try to convince him to take certain um, measures to defend and, and protect and sustain his own life. And Jesus kept quoting scripture at him. Um, it is written, one does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Do not put the Lord your God to the test. Away with you, Satan. Oops. Um, for it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve only him. And so we've got the quotes from Deuteronomy where, um, where those passages come from. So he talks about that. Then we get um, several quotes um, from the Ten Commandments. So we have um, just a direct, you know, you shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery. We've got some other laws about divorce, um, certificates of divorce, but the, and this is from um, the Sermon on the Mount now, where he's saying, you know, you've heard it was said this, quote the scripture and then he says but I say to you this is how we ought to interpret this so he's not overturning the order not to murder but he is interpreting what that means I say to you if you look at your neighbor with anger then you have already murdered him in your heart so he's giving us that interpretive lens telling us how we're supposed to to read um, we've got the eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, um, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. And then we come to um, Hosea uh, chapter 6, verse 6. And this is interesting because references to this or similar passages uh, by Jesus in, in the Gospels appear more often than any other passage. And so that's important for us to, to, to um, notice. Um, Jesus said, um, I assume that says go. Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. For I've come to call not the righteous, but sinners. And the passage from Hosea is, I desire sacrifice, 
steadfast love and not sacrifice the knowledge of God rather than burnt offerings. And that appears um, in chapter five among the, the Sermon on the Mount. And it appears again in chapter 12. And then, um, did I put that one here? I did not, but there's a, there's a third one that I guess I didn't put in here. So Hosea chapter six is the most oft, often quoted um, Old Testament verse of, of Jesus, which I think we'll, we'll wanna make sure we keep in mind. Then we've got some Micah and Malachi. Another, ver another reference to the, the Ten Commandments, honor your father and your mother. Um, and then, oh, here it is. This, so this one is um, in chapter 15, Jesus says, in vain do they worship me teaching human precepts as doctrine. And this is a reference to Isaiah 29 verse 13, which is very a parallel verse to that Hosea um, 6, 6. So I put that one in here. The Lord said, because these people draw near with their mouths and honor me with their lips, while their hearts are far from me, and their worship of me is a human commandment learned by rote. So this is a criticism of the way that they're living. The people worship with their mouths and their lips, but their hearts are far away. Their worship is made by human hands. They learn it by rote. They don't really worship. They're just going through the motions. So similar to um, Hosea 6, for I desire steadfast love and not sacrifice the knowledge of God rather than burnt offerings. Um, let's see what else. Another honor your father and mother. So another reference to the Ten Commandments. Shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. On Leviticus 19.18, you shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against any of your people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. That one's quoted twice um, in Matthew. And some Psalms. Some other... Um, Kind of you know specific fulfillments of, of scripture jesus said to them you will all be deserters because of me this night um, and then the final one is when jesus dies my god my god why have you forsaken me which is um from psalm 22 verse 1. so do you all have this um accessible to you i have it <laughs> oh awesome so what uh did you, did you have a chance to kind of look it over at all? What kind of, what sticks out to you as important for the way that Jesus reads the Bible, for what Jesus is emphasizing? I didn't have a chance to look it over. I was glad okay. I got it copied. <laughs> that's okay. I'm, that's good that you got a copy so you can take a look at it later. Karen, did you have anything? Oh, we can't hear you again. Um, I haven't even, I didn't even know you'd sent it until just a few minutes okay. ago. No, that's okay. I can, I'll tell you what my notes say and then you can read through it later and see if you agree with me or if you have disagreements, I'd love to hear them later. Okay, um, we will. <laughs> and I kind of, uh, I kind of brought some of these up as I was reading. Um, we have a lot of Ten Commandments references. Never does he say, you know, look at the Ten Commandments, but he brings up several of the commandments in various places and, and talks about them and and doesn't just say follow this, but kind of gives us an interpretive lens for how to follow it, how to read it, how to understand it. Um, that Leviticus 19 verse 8 appears twice. Um, it's about loving our neighbors as ourselves, not judging them. And then like I said, um, Hosea, references to Hosea 6.6 6, and um, it's kind of counterpart Isaiah 29, 13 appear three times um, in, in the Gospel of Matthew. For I desire mercy, not sacrifice, and acknowledgement of God rather than burnt offerings. And then the other one, the Lord says, these people come near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. 
Their worship of me is made up only of rules taught by men. And so I think in summary, you know, if, if we're looking for what Jesus um, emphasizes, what Jesus raises up as most important um, as, as the meta narrative, as the lens through which we should read the rest of scripture, it's the Ten Commandments, the expectation that we need to love rather than judge, and this very clear and very unambiguous command that we need to adopt a new paradigm for what it means to live God's way. That going through the rote sacrifices, performative religion, um, you know, acting like you're, you're a follower, going to church, um, you know, paying your, your tithe and standing there where you're supposed to stand and sitting there when you're supposed to sit and being seen as a Christian is not what God is looking for. God is looking for your life to look the way that, um, that Hosea 6 says, I desire mercy, not sacrifice. I desire steadfast love. I desire the knowledge of God rather than burnt offerings. And knowledge of God doesn't just mean, you know, what's in your head. It means what's in your heart, the way that you live your life. So, you know, kind of conclusions for me, um, if we're looking to be faithful to God, um, perhaps, you know, I don't know if, that, if anybody here today is feeling this way, but if we're looking for reassurance about our eternal destination, if we're trying to figure out, you know, what's important so that we can make sure that we're on God's side at the end, I don't think that Jesus is very subtle about what we should focus on to those who have eyes to see and ears to hear. It's not difficult to figure this out if you read the right things. And if we look at what Jesus is quoting from his own scriptures, then it tells us what we need to do. We need to love mercy. We need to live with hum humility. We need to not judge. We need to leave vengeance up to God. We need to defend the righteous, which of course, remember, is defined as those who have nothing those who are not supported by this world. Um, but the big question I think is, can we actually live this way? You know, are we brave enough to do this? Because this is not just countercultural to our secular culture. This is in a lot of ways countercultural to our Christian culture in this country, especially now when Christianity and American nationalism are so heavily bound to one another. And so, you know, I think in this way, I feel, I feel that this is, this is kind of the way for me to reclaim the Bible, because a big problem in, in the past few decades has been that the conservative evangelicals have kind of taken over biblical interpretation in our country, and, and, you know, claim to have the only way to read, the only right to interpret. And I think we've kind of given that to them. I think we've kind of let go of the Bible because it's confusing and difficult and it's got all these passages that are that are challenging. But I think if we read through the lens of Jesus, I think if we take seriously, you know, the, the words of Jesus that came out of his mouth and we say these are the, the passages that are going to be our, our glasses that we're going to put on when we read anything else, then, you know, when someone brings up, well, God said that it was an abomination for those men to, to take the visitors um, to Lot. So I'm, I'm going to condemn homosexuality. Well, you know, you can certainly interpret it that way. But Leviticus 19.18, which Jesus quotes twice in the book of Matthew alone, says that you should not judge you should love your neighbor as yourself so how are you going to respond to that does it matter if this person is doing something that you think is inappropriate as long as they're not hurting anybody else so that's that's me that's my perspective you know um I had a discussion with, um, no, I did it again. 
I had a discussion with um, the person that I had who was the caretaker for Jack. And um, she attends Bethel Church. And so there were lots of things that we agreed about, but there was a lot that we didn't also. And um, one day we were having a discussion and I said, um, well, you know, there, there is only one God. And she said, yes. And I said, and so how he revealed himself to Hindus or Buddhists or, or anybody else in the world is it may be different from the way that he revealed himself to me, but that doesn't mean that they're wrong, that, you know, basically what I was saying is that we all worship the same God. We just do it in different ways. She took great offense at that. And that there was, that because they worshiped a different, um, in my point, you know, in my viewpoint, it's a different um, image, maybe, but it's the same God. And she said, no, but there's, God is three, you know, there's God and Jesus and the Holy Spirit. And I said, I know. And so maybe all of those parts haven't been revealed to everybody in the world, but that doesn't mean that they don't worship the same God. So she didn't agree with that at all. And I said, well, then what about Jews? I mean, I understand that. I, I believe that Jews worship the same God I do. They just don't, they just don't go far enough to get to Jesus. But that, it's the same God. Am I wrong? So probably if, if she uh, didn't quote this at you, then she would have if she knew it. Um, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to oh, the Father except through me. I know. Um, and and I think it I think it comes back to, you know, how do we read that kind of thing? So if we're reading that from our own perspective, remember, we are violent and selfish from birth. We are corrupt. We are incapable of doing anything but violence all the way back to Noah and his family and the covenant that God made because God acknowledges that that's who we are. And so we need to acknowledge that that's who we are too. And because of that, I want to read, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Well, I get it right. I follow Jesus. And so I've got it. But you don't. I want it to be that way. I want to have that duality. I want to have something up on other people. I want to be the one who's in the know. I want to be the insider while you're the outsider. If everybody's an insider, that makes me uncomfortable. That makes me worry. That that takes away the, the, the leg up that I have in that situation. But it does not say, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through believing in me or knowing who I am or worshiping me or using the word Jesus when, I, when you go to worship in any kind. It doesn't say that. It says through me. And so it is perfectly possible to read even that that seems very clear to certain groups of people that that means that no other religion besides Christianity could possibly be legitimate. You could read that to say, no one comes to the Father except through the actions of Jesus. And by acting, by dying for us, and we'll talk about how that works next week with some atonement theories, by living on earth as a human and dying for us, Jesus has already reconciled us to God. And so mm -hmm. you can do whatever you want. You can try to earn your way into whatever heaven you, you know, or whatever word you want to call it. Um, you can, you can behave in terrible ways or good ways. You can take care of each other or not. But I am the, the way that you all get to the Father. And whether or not you want to get to the Father at, at this point 
is irrelevant because God's purpose in this world is to gather all things in. And I have already accomplished that and it is finished. And so, and so in that way, that's a completely different interpretation. It's an opposite interpretation, in fact, of what people typically interpret that passage to mean. But that's, I appreciate that, that's what it says. You know, you have to look at what it says and what it doesn't say. Mm-hmm. You know, I was really, I was really stunned. I was working at NVCSS a few years ago. And I don't know, it was back when they were changing the, the Pope. I forget which change it was. I worked there a long time. <laughs> but something came, something came over the loud, we didn't even have a loudspeaker, but they were talking about the different gods. And I was thinking, what? I mean, the Catholics don't have a special god as opposed to Protestants or evangelicals or whatever. I, I just, I was, I was really surprised by that. And all the people there that are Catholic just kind of said, well, you know, no big deal. It's just, you know. So it was interesting. Yeah, but I, I think it, that's, I think that's part of that human violence, that violence that we do to ourselves and to each other, trying to create <clears throat> a, a divisions yeah. where there are none, trying to put ourselves above others in terms of, you know, knowing better information or being more faithful to who God wants us to be or what have you. You know, um, back, well, let's see, I, I've been a Lutheran for, fifth, oh no, longer than that. I've been a Lutheran for a long time, okay, since my kids were little, but I wasn't born a Lutheran. And so when, when uh, Hartley Lee uh, became our pastor, um, I wanted to know more about Lutheranism and, and I wanted to join the church. And um, so he gave me a little booklet about, I, I don't remember the name of it right now. I have it upstairs, but it says um, on being a Lutheran or something like that. It was just a little pamphlet kind of booklet. But the very first words in that book, and the reason why I became a Lutheran, was that it said, do Lutherans believe they have the uh, only true religion? And the answer was yes, but they don't believe they're the only ones who have it. And it was because of that sentence, because I have never felt comfortable with that that uh, I'm better than you are, or I'm the only person who knows the truth or whatever. I've never felt comfortable with that. Mm -hmm. And that was the reason why I joined St. James. And that was, gosh, over 50 years ago. So um, I guess that's where I'm coming from is, yeah, I I believe in God and, and Jesus and the Holy Spirit. But I don't think I have the exclusive truth about that, hmm. you know, mm-hmm. and and I, I don't I don't know. I mean, I would think that people who are judgmental about that would probably be violent against what God wants. Because I don't think God wants us to be separated by stuff like that. Mm-hmm. I don't know. No, I agree. <laughs> That's my soapbox. <laughs> so we are gonna. <coughs> excuse me. We are gonna have some really good conversations the next couple of weeks about some of this stuff, because um, we're gonna we're gonna go all over some of these some of these topics. So next week, like I said, we're gonna talk about atonement, and uh, atonement just means you know how does God make us right. And um, it has to do with the cross, what actually happens on the cross. We say that Jesus died for our sins, but what does that mean? How does that work, you know, logically? What is, what is it about the cross or what is it about Jesus that enables God to then suddenly be okay with us, even though we're horrible and evil and sinful and violent? Um, so we'll talk about that. you have the answer to that? that? I do not. I do not. But I have a, sh- I have a chart. Okay. I have a chart. <laughs>
Okay. <laughs> um, and then the week after that, we're going to talk about the final judgment because I felt like that was something that was kind of missing from our, uh, our book. If we're going to talk about violence, then we better talk about eternal violence, damnation. If God's purpose is to reconcile all things, to undo the, the violence, to restore the creation to its goodness, then, you know, how can we have a God who is going to send anyone or anything to eternal punishment and, and eternal violence? So we'll talk about that the final week. And then it'll be Christmas. So Merry Christmas after we talk about, you know, some hellfire <laughs> and damnation. <laughs> That's a Christmas theme if I ever heard one. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you both so much for a great conversation. I hope you have a great week. I hope you're feeling better soon, Karen. Sorry about your fall. Thank you. Thank you. And I will see you both next week. Okay. Bye-bye. Okay. Great. Take care.